Good afternoon, or early evening. I'm Solicon Nohead, uh, Silicon of Vincent P. Adams, and I'm co-founder of Vets I Am, along with my lovely wife, Navia uh, Leslie Adams. And I want to welcome you here to our late afternoon or early evening uh, Saturday Shabbat service. This is, uh, section is entitled, uh, Energy of the Hebrew Letters. Energy of the Hebrew Letters. In Kabbalah, the basis for every single teaching and every single practice is the Hebrew letters, the power of the Hebrew letters. And if you're not familiar with that, if this is your first exposure to uh, biblical Hebrew and, and the Hebrew olive day, I want to give you uh, some foundation, first of all, as to why I make that statement. You know, a lot of people say a lot of things, uh, but it could just be their opinion or conjecture or extremely subjective or what have you. But I always like to uh, establish all of my opinions in some sort of basis, basis of fact, either from the Bible, either from the Zohar or the Sefer Yitzhak or, or some ancient text. Everything that I say, uh, virtually none of it is, is, is merely my opinion. And it's all based in, uh, on the ancient text. And I always quote them and, and, uh, so that you can uh, check me out and look them up for yourself. Um, I'd like you, um, and, well, you won't be able to see it, but I'm going to um, open up my program here. Oh, oh, you got me online here, I see. I am. I'm closing several times. It's, it's not closing. Okay. I tried to reduce it. So I wanted to just, I, you know, I would kind of like to bring it back up, so I didn't want to close it all the way, but every time I, I do it, it's, so I guess I'm just going to have to close it. Okay. And pull this one up. We're going to go and, and take a look at the book of Revelation, which is the last uh, book of the Bible, of the uh, Christian Bible. And then, you know, there, you know, when you say the Bible in Christianity, a lot of people don't, don't know this or don't think about it, but there are several different Bibles in Christianity. Uh, the Catholics have their own canon. Uh, the Protestant movement, such as, you know, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, they have their own canon. The Eastern Orthodox Church has its own canon. The Orthodox Church of Ethiopia has its own canon. And, you know, canon means number of books or rule. Uh, the Coptic Church in Egypt has their own canon. And, and there are probably a few others that I'm not even naming. So when you say the Bible, you know, what do you really mean? You know, it, it's, uh, it's relative to, you know, where you are or to who you're talking to, perhaps. So, but in all, but, but in everyone's canon, uh, the book of Revelation is the last book. And the Protestant canon is a subset of all the canons. Everyone has the Protestant canon when it, within its canon. So you can say that the Protestant canon is the smallest and is the one that is universally agreed upon by Christianity. Just a, a little, little seminary lesson there. Paid all that money for that education. Got to get some use out of it sometime. Okay. If we turn to, I, I'm going to read for you. <clears throat> have to uh, turn to this. A Bible is not necessarily required for this course. But if you turn to the book of Revelation in chapter 1, verse 8, and you read uh, the standard um, King James translation, which most people are very, very familiar with, it will say in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, 
and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, if you go back um, and look at a, a few other verses, um, let's begin at, at verse 5 just to pick up the context. You know, who is saying that I'm Alpha and Omega is extremely important. So we picked up we pick up that context, I believe, as we will um, read from verse 5. It said, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and, and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Okay, I, John, who also uh, am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom, and patience of Jesus Christ was in this was in the isle that is called Patmos. John was exiled by the Romans to the Isle of Patmos. Historical fact, not just biblical uh, hyperbole or whatever. For the I was in exile to the island of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, churches which are in Asia, uh, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and behind, and, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Now, Son of Man is a classical term uh, for Jesus. And the reason why I read that down to that, uh, to that point was to uh, just give you the context of what was going on here. Uh, John was uh, fell into a trance in the spirit. He had basically um, astral projected. You know, I know Christians don't like that word. He astral projected into the heavenly realms, had an out of body experience, or as we Christians like to say, because we don't like those words, we just like to say he was in the spirit. Okay? And when he was in the spirit, he, he really says, I don't even, I, I don't quite know if I was in the spirit or if I was just actually, you know, caught up. But he said he heard this voice. And the voice, you know, had, had the voice of a trumpet saying, I'm Alpha and Omega. Now, I read that to you in the King James Version in order to illustrate and show you how much we lose in the translation from the original language into English. The King James Version was translated um, from Greek, as most people know, into English. And most people uh, believe that the, uh, the Bible was originally written in Greek, and that's totally false and in error. It was actually written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic, which is a dialect, of Hebrew. Matter of fact, you know, Jesus himself, and I'm using the word Jesus, to, you know, so it will be understood by the uninitiated. Jesus himself spoke Aramaic. That was the common language spoken uh, in um, Israel, in Jerusalem, in he all of Israel at the time that he walked the earth during the first century, during the, uh, the Roman occupation. They spoke um, uh, Aramaic. Now, I want to um, 
Now the Eastern Church, remember I, I talked about the different canons and I mentioned the Eastern Orthodox? The Eastern Orthodox Church, their Bible is translated from the original Hebrew and Aramaic, unlike the Roman Catholics, or, the, or I should say the West. Mm -hmm. The Western Church trans, uh, has a translation from Greek in the English the Eastern Church, the other half, the other whole half of the world, has their translation from the original Hebrew and Aramaic into English or even other languages, perhaps. And this translation from that we're used to in in the West from Greek to English loses uh, so much. It's, it's, you know, you miss so much revelation, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. I'm going to read to you now that same account out of the Aramaic English New Testament. And this is by uh, a Jewish man named uh, Andrew Gabriel Roth, uh, one of the best uh, scholars I, I've come across um, in, in a long time. I, uh, I think this translation is uh, by far uh, one, of the, one of the better translations from uh, Hebrew and Aramaic into, into English. Let's take me a moment. Get there here. Okay. And we just want to, we want to create the foundation so we have some basis in fact or some basis in something for everything else that you know that we're going to teach. So if someone questions you, uh, you know, where did you get that that junk from? Where did you get that garbage from? And just from the Bible, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the, and it's usually going to be a Christian who's probably going to be saying that anyway. So you say from the Bible, the one that you, you know, don't read. <laughs> you know, the one you don't read every day, and you let people. Uh, tell you what it says. Oh my God. Uh, chapter 1. Uh, turn to page 666. I haven't noticed that before. Oh, okay. Chapter 1 of Revelation begins on page 666. I know he did that on purpose. <laughs> I've never noticed the page numbers before, you know. Because usually when you, you know, when you, when you reference the Bible, you just go to the book, you know. Go by page numbers so much. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to talk to him about that. <laughs> okay. Okay, beginning at verse 5 there, chapter 1, it says, From Yeshua, the Mashiach. Yeshua is what um, is the name that Jesus' mother called him. So I prefer to call Jesus what his mother called him Yeshua. Okay? says in verse 5, and from Yeshua the Mashiach. Mashiach is Hebrew from Messiah. Okay? And from Yeshua the Mashiach, the witness, the faithful, the firstborn of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, who has loved us and released us from our sins by his blood, and has made us a kingdom of priests to Elohim, the Father, to whom be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he comes with clouds, and all eyes will see him, and also they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth, all born on account of him. Yes. Amen. I am Aleph, also Tom, says the Master Yahweh, Elohim, who is and was and is to come, the Omnipotent, I, Yokanah, that's Hebrew for John. I, Yokanah, Yokanah, your brethren partake with you in the affliction and suffering that are in Yeshua the Mashiach was in the island called Patmos because of the word of Elohim. Elohim is um, Hebrew for God. It's actually plural. Okay? Because of the word of Elohim, and because of the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah. I was in the spirit on the day of our master Yahweh. And I heard behind me a great voice 
as, a, as of a shofar, which said, that which you see write in a book, and send it to the seven assemblies, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned myself to look at the voice that talked with me. And when I heard, and when I had turned, I saw seven menorahs. You know how it doesn't say, I saw seven candles. Right. Now, that's the menorah, seven, a seven-branch candelabra. Now, that's uh, a big significance from seeing seven little candles burning. Is, is it not? Mm -hmm. He said he saw seven menorahs. See how it expands the, the meaning, you know, from, say, 7 to 49. You know, really, you know, there's, he saw 49, you know, burning flames as opposed to 7. What does that number mean? What does four, what's the relevance of 49 as opposed to 1? I'm not going to answer that question, but ponder it. If you're really looking for the true meaning of this scripture, you have to ponder that. And that's from the original language. Now, he said, I saw seven menorahs of gold. And in the midst of the menorahs, one like the Son of Man, clothed to the feet and turned about in a row, reaching to his feet. Okay. Uh, with a white, with a, 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 with a girdle of gold. I'll just stop there. Now, going back through that, Remember in the King James it says, I heard a voice like a trumpet. But here in the, uh, uh, the translation from the original Hebrew and Aramaic, it said, I heard a voice as a shofar. Okay? And if you want to find out what a shofar is, you can look at the note down there. Um, it's actually, I'll just hold it up for you. This is a shofar. Okay, hand me one of the ram's horn shofars too. Has a very distinct sound that a trumpet probably does not make. If, if you uh, look through scripture, you will see that in the Old Testament, the Israelites were commanded to blow the holy shofar before they went into battle in order to ensure themselves a victory. And this one is, uh, this is called a Yemenite shofar. It's from an African antelope, a really magnificent looking looking beast if you ever get to see one and it has, you know, these two spiraling horns coming out of his head. And it makes a very distinct sound. Get different tones. And then this is a, an actual ranch horn. So far, now. these are actually from Israel. So he heard a voice as a mighty shofar speaking with him. Now, when we look at the King James and it says trumpet. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you the fullness of the text because when you see shofar, now you've got to go back all the way to the Old Testament and look up the uses of the shofar. When the Jews were given the Torah at Mount Sinai, when they received the Ten Commandments and the Torah, it says that they heard the shofar blowing louder and louder. The shofar. Not a trumpet, you know, not this instrument of brass or metal, you know, that, you know, Louis Armstrong plays, okay? A shofar, a, a horn from a, a living animal. And the reason why it is said that it is a shofar, when um, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, and he was getting ready to kill Isaac, and... God said, stop, I just wanted to see if you would do it. There was a ram who was caught by his horns, horns in the thicket. So 
whenever the shofar is born, blown, it is a sign and signal of mercy. Because uh, Isaac was spared being sacrificed by a ram who had his horns caught in a thicket of bushes and he couldn't get untangled. And so um, Abraham, you know, caught him, slew him, and made the sacrifice. So it's a symbol of mercy. It's a symbol of power. When they marched around Jericho seven times and blew, they didn't blow trumpets. The original language, if you read it in Hebrew, they blew a shofar. So it's a symbol of mercy, and it's a symbol of power. So when you translate it into, uh, into Greek and then into Hebrew, it, it loses all meaning, or it loses a lot of meaning. Go ahead. Jump in. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't mention, but jump in, ask questions. This is interactive. Anytime, stop me, uh, ask a question or whatever. This is uh, very interesting. Uh, as I learned uh, about a year ago, was, uh, and I want to ask you, uh, maybe you bring out uh, one day, when Moses blew the shofar on Mount Sinai, over Mount Sinai, it was, uh, I've heard it was bringing in the age of Aries, the ram, uh, the age of mercy, perhaps. I heard that once upon a time, when you heard that. Right. Actually, what, what it is, it wasn't the, I, I, it, might, it might have been the age of Aries the ram, but actually uh, it wasn't Moses who blew it. It was God himself blowing it. He was the one, you know, his voice was like a shofar. So um, he also told them that that time is going to be the beginning of months for them. The first month of the Hebrew calendar is called Nisan which is Aries. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if that's what you heard or if that actually ushered in the age of Aries. It, it, it could definitely have been, but it was certainly the constellation that was up there at that time was the constellation of Aries, Durant. And speaking of the astrology that you mentioned earlier, and uh, first of all, heard that uh, Christ brought in the age of I have to go back and look look that look that up in astrological. Really interesting stuff. Okay, could 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 very well be. And now we're bringing the age of Aquarius. We're in the age of we definitely are in the age of Aquarius yeah. now. Yeah. You know, have like a twenty two hundred year age. Okay. Well, then you're you're, pro you're probably right about that. And what's interesting about that issuing in the age is to show you how the Bible supports the study of astrology. Um, in order for them to be released from bondage in Egypt, what did they have? To, they had to slay a, a, a lamb, which is what they call uh, the Passover lamb or Pesach. You got that mm -hmm. the, You know, Pesach meaning Passover, the death angel passed them by. And it was representative of Yeshua of the time when he would come and be crucified on the cross. So you had the, uh, that was the beginning of months, the beginning of Aries. You know, they, they slayed the lamb, ate it, put his blood on, on the, you know, their three sides of the door, which is the symbol of the cross, uh, on both sides. And it was, as I said, pointed out, it wasn't Moses blowing the shofar. It was God himself. It, his voice sounded like a shofar. And depending on your level of spirituality, it is said uh, some heard a shofar blowing, some heard thunder, and some there actually heard the voice of God. And I tell everyone, I blow the shofar every Shabbat at various times. And I tell everyone to steal themselves and see what they receive in their spirit, what voice do they hear in their spirit and in their inner being when the shofar is being blown. And I always try to blow it from out of my spirit, you know, except in a, a, a general demonstration like that that I just did. But um, now we get back into Revelation. He said, he heard, we know that on Mount Sinai, that it was definitely Yahweh, God, speaking. 
Now when we get back here to Revelation, remember in the Greek, um, this book is called Apocalypse, which means simply not devastation and destruction as we've come to use the word apocalypse. It actually means unveiling. This book is the unveiling of Yeshua HaMashiach. We're supposed to finally realize who he is at this point in detail. So when, when, when Yochanan, Yochanan said that I turned and I saw the Son of Man, and which we know is, is Yeshua, and Yeshua is saying, hey, I'm out of time. Okay, in verse 8, he says, I'm out of, I'm out of also time, says the Master Yahweh. Elohim. He's saying, I am God. Okay? God and me are one and the same. It's saying that right there for you to see in black and white. And that's the unveiling. That's the unveiling. The revelation. The revelation. He says, I'm, I'm all of also taught, says the Master Yahweh, Elohim, God, who is and was and is to come. Now you know that's, and, and now he gets into the description of himself as Yeshua, as he was on earth. I am, okay, now that's a play on words. I am, you know, when God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai, he said, tell them I am that I am. So right there he's saying, you know, I am, I was, and I'm coming again. As, as you see it right there in verse 8. Who is and was and is to come. The omnipotent. Yeshua, Jesus, is saying that he is omnipotent. There can only be one omnipotent being in the universe, or else he's not omnipotent. You know, if me and you say, if, if, if you and I share equal power, then I'm not omnipotent. And you're not omnipotent. Even though we share, we may share all of the power of the universe. But I can't claim to be omnipotent if you share that power too. Because omnipotent means all powerful, plain and simple. So he's saying, I am God Almighty. I'm the omnipotent one. I'm the Master Yahweh. I'm Yeshua. I, I, you know, I am, I existed, I was, and I'm coming again at the end of the age. Now, for our discussion on the energy of the Hebrew letters, at the beginning of verse 8 there it says, I am also, I am Aleph, also Tom. In the Greek translation it says, I'm, I'm um, Alpha and Omega. Now, what does that mean? The beginning and the end. Now, that's revelatory, somewhat. But when it is translated into Hebrew, it becomes far more revelatory. Because the Hebrew tradition is, whenever you mention something at the beginning of a list, and you say it, such as Allah, and then you say the last thing in that list, right behind it. It means that you are, in, it automatically means that you are including everything in between. So when he says, I'm Olive and Todd, or Olive and also Todd, he is actually saying, I'm the Olive Bet. I am the Hebrew letters. I'm Olive Bet, Gimbal, Dal, A, Bob, Zion. Het, tet, yo, kal, lamet, mim, nu, samin, ayin. Pei, sani, kro, reish, shin, ta. Now that's quite interesting. Wow. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I'm the olive bay. Now what does that mean? He's the alphabet? You know, well, okay, that, that's kind of weird, ain't it? You know. He, he's saying that he is the Word of God. He literally is the Word of God. He is the olive thing. That is why, from that statement right there, that is why 
I can call this class the energy of the Hebrew letters. That is why each and every letter in Hebrew has a power, an anointing, or if you will, and I'm going to use a word that Christians hate, a magic, okay? I prefer to use the word anointing. That's my Christian background myself. But there is something more to the Hebrew letters or language than there is to any other language on earth. Because it is actually, as I like to say, it, it's the essence of God. It's the essence of Yeshua. Now you say, okay, all right, I see the basis of what you're saying. You know, Shalika, Rabbi Vince. Um, I, I don't know if I believe that it's the essence. Let's go to Colossians, the book of Colossians. Chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. You might have to use the index to find the book of Colossians there. I'm going to read it out of, out of the King James anyway. Um, it's, you know, talk, it said, verse 13. Well, 12, just, just to make sure you have the context. Give me thanks unto the Father which has made us need to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Talking about Yeshua or Jesus. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood that he shed on Calvary on the cross, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or these are ranks of angels or demons or spirits, whether they be thrones or, or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. Now, if you read other translations, it says that all things were created by him, for him, and through him, or out of him. So, what he's saying that all of creation was created out of him, out of his internal being, out of his out of his essence, as I like to say. And he said all things consist of him, as you saw there. All things were created out of him, or through him, or by him. All things consist of him. You know, uh, my, my glass case is made up of Jesus. My glass case is made up of Yeshua. Because everything that was ever created, seen and unseen, consists of him and came out of him. So, the Hebrew Alphabet. The Hebrew letters is the, as one book puts it, is the protoplasm or the DNA of the entire universe. Yeshua is the creator of everything. His essence, that's, that's why in Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, he says, I'm Yalata. And here, he is saying everything was created out of, you know, just, you know, open me up and pull it out. You know, everything was created out of me. You know, but what does what does me consist of? Revelation, he tells us, the all of time. And all Jews, all Judaism believe that the world was created 
by the alphabet. That's what you call the Hebrew letters, alphabet. You know, we call ours the ABCs. The uh, Hebrew letters are called the alphabet. And interesting enough, the alphabet actually the, is is a real word. That word actually means to pulsate. To vibrate and to pulse it. So even looking at the letters, Yod He Vav He, that's the Tetragrammaton, the Hemi Forest, as they say uh, in Hebrew, the name of God, Yahweh, Yod He Vav He, even looking at those letters, you're receiving an energy. Because it's pulsating right now. The vibration. The vibration. Mm -hmm. Then when you say it, whoa, now you really get a vibration. And you don't have to know what it actually means in order to receive the benefit of it. It's just like, do you have to know what water is to receive the benefit of water when you drink it? No, your body knows what it is. As soon as you drink it, your body, you know, sucks it up, does what it needs to do with it, uses it, uh, you know, washes you out and, and, and sends it on its way and is ready for the next batch. Your body, your body knows what's in water, what it needs. You don't have to be a chemist, a physicist, or a nutritionist um, for your body to receive the benefits of water. Your body knows. Same way with Hebrew. Your spirit knows what you consist of, what you need. And whenever, yeah, go ahead. You are a spirit. You are a spirit. Some people really don't really. Okay. You are a spirit. You have a mind and you live in a body. And the Bible says it's the spirit that quickens. It's the spirit that gives life to the flesh. So whenever you're looking at Hebrew, you're receiving some benefit. As long as you know that. As long as, you know, even, well, even if you don't know it. But if you know it, then you can really absorb it. Then you really get a chunk of it. So when you see Hebrew, you know, when you see the, the Torah or the Bible written in Hebrew, even if you don't know the Hebrew language, it's good to look at every word as if you do. It's just like drinking those, I don't know how many ounces of water they say you're supposed to drink every day. It's, eight. it's just like drinking those eight ounces of water. Your spirit is receiving the energy of the olive bed when, when you, you do that. It's like spiritual environment to be to me. Spiritual vitamins, whatever whatever you want to call it. You know, I, I really think that's why uh, the nation of Israel is so blessed. It's because they're speaking Hebrew. I mean, when they get up and just read the newspaper in the morning, you know, they're receiving a blessing. When they read, a, 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 you know, an advertisement, you know, for a clothing store on the side of a bus going by, they're, they're receiving and in, in the Old Testament, it's, you know, God said, wherever I place my name, that's where I'll be. Uh, look down at that bottom of that sheet there, and you're going to see, second from the last letter, a letter that looks like a pitchfork, has three prongs. That's the letter Sheen. It is considered to be the mission of God. The Jews regard that when they see that as God's name, El Shaddai, the destroyer, and the nourisher. You notice it has three prongs for God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or as representative of the three-column system of the ten C for all, Keter, Hakma, and Bina. And whenever you, uh, you see that, is considered, like I said, it's considered the initial of God, especially in Kabbalah. If you've ever seen Tefillin, 
You've seen the little boxes that Jews wear on the top of their head, and they wrap their arms in leather straps, and they wear a box on their, their left bicep. Mm -hmm. You ever seen a picture of it? On either side of that box is the letter Shin. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about that, God said, wherever I place my name, that's where I'll be. The city of Jerusalem is comprised by three valleys called the Hidron, the Kidron, and the Tyropian Valley. All three of those valleys connect and run into each other, and they form the letter Sheen. Jerusalem is the center of the universe. That's why in the Bible God says, don't divide my holy city. You're dividing the spiritual power. You're limiting the spiritual power. Now you can understand why he made a fight for that land. He wanted to save well, his plan is that, you know, to tear it up. You know, it's vitally important that Jerusalem never be divided. God has literally placed his name there and stamped it into the earth mm -hmm. with the letter Sheen. Now I think about the coach and the monster and one to say, you know, when we talk about God is. Say what? Your quote, but God is intensely. Intensely. I'll, I, have a, I make them I have a little call and response that I do. Uh, where we, I say God is, and everybody responds intensely, purposeful. Yeah, you know, it's really amazing. Every, everything, everything has has a tremendous meaning and and purpose. So, I, I think you, you you can see my basis now for saying for calling this meet up uh, energy of the Hebrew letters. We're going to be learning about their twenty. Uh, here's you know. Another way that um, you see the magnificence and the uh, intelligence of the Hebrew letters, there are 22 letters. You have 22 chrom chromosomes that determine who you are. And the 23rd uh, chromosome only determines your sex. 22 chromosomes. 22 Hebrew letters. Quite interesting. Very interesting. Now, from Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, we understand who is the Olivet. We know that it's Yeshua. From Colossians chapter 1, verses 14, 15, and 16, we know who created the world and what the world consists of and his essence. So from those two verses of scripture, we know what the world, we know who made the world and what it is actually made out of. Now, let's uh, take a, a, a quick look at John, the fourth gospel. John chapter 1, Verse 1. And don't worry, I'm not going to give you a Bible lesson every week, but I just want to get some foundation and some groundwork laid. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of the world. Now, it says, in the beginning. Now, in our Western mindset, when we read that, in the beginning, we read that as once upon a time, okay, but actually, if you read that with an Eastern mindset and a knowledge of the scriptures, what is actually saying, who, first of all, who was the beginning? 
in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, Yeshua says he's the beginning. And the end. He says he's the beginning. So when you read it with that mindset and with that knowledge and revelation, it's saying inside of Yeshua was the word. Or inside, if we reread this, it's saying inside Yeshua was the Isle of Bait. And the Isle of Bait was with God. And the Isle of Bait was God. The same was in Yeshua with God. Do you see how, how I did that? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we you know it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, we go back and we we define we you know we, we leap ahead or we come back from uh, Revelation chapter one and we define what's the beginning. And we know that the beginning was Yeshua. Okay. And so it says, in the beginning, so in, in, in Yeshua was the Isle of Bay. Because we now know that the Isle of Bay is Yeshua, or the Isle of Bay is the Word. When you combine them in various combinations, you, you get the Word. So again, in Yeshua was the Isle of Bay, and the Isle of Bay was with God. And the Isle of Bait was God. More support for the Trinity. There's one God, just one God. He manifests himself to us in different forms. And that, but it is still just one God. I'm not saying that there are three people sitting up there looking down, going, hey, what do you think about that? You know, it's just one God. Okay. Now, let's go to Genesis. Chapter 1, verse 1. And someone hand Shane the, um, the other Bible right there. <laughs> Open that, that Bible up. I don't have my copy. i got to remember to always put myself a copy up here. To chapter 1, verse 1. And we want to take a look at this in the original language. This chapter of Genesis in Hebrew is called Bereshit. Bereshit. It means in the beginning. Now, if you turn to page 7, you will see Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 there. And they've taken the, um, the liberty to actually, uh, for reasons that I'm going to point out, They've taken the liberty of, of putting it in Hebrew so that you can catch the revelation. It says, Bereshit, Bar, Elohim, Alatah, Hashemayim, Viet Haaretz. Okay? Bereshit actually means in the beginning. Bar means created. Bereshit created God. Aleph Tav has no interpretation. No one knows what Aleph Tav means in terms of a word. Now, there are some uh, grammaticans, uh, grammarians, who say that it's a direct object marker. And they may translate it as it or, or whatever. But in reality, no one knows what Aleph Tav means. Now, Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, as you can see on the sheet that I gave you. Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's there, but we don't know what it means. So you would read that in the beginning, created, El, you know, Elohim, and it has Aleph Tav, and you don't know what the heck that means. Ha Shemayim. Ha is the Hebrew 
words of God. Shemaim is the Hebrew word for the heavens. Now it says Ziyat. Ha Aretz. Ha, remember, is the Hebrew word for the. Aretz is the Hebrew word for earth or ground or land. So it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now remember, in John chapter 1, we got a little bit of a revelation of who Yeshua was at that time, you know. And then in, it's interesting that that was written by John. And also the book of Revelation was written by John. So we get a revelation of who Yeshua is in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in Revelation chapter 1, he tells you who the Altar is. Remember in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was actually with God. You have all of Tom there. Who is all of Tom with? Mm -hmm. Right next to you. Right next to Elohim. Mm -hmm. In the beginning. Yeah. So in the language is a clue as to who Yeshua is all the way going back to the book of Genesis. You want me to take a moment to just blow it up on the screen? I can, I can never blow it up. I actually, what I want to do... the Hebrew... Uh, Hebrew. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm going to go. Okay. Uh, hold on. Let me let me first. Oh, that's not what I want to do. You have a mouse? No. Yeah, right. Right here. Hold on. Let me switch to a Hebrew version. Nope. I'm not going to do that either. No need. I just go. I just go right here. Yeah. And it should give it to me. Is that Genesis though? No, it's back in Revelation. Not giving me. What is it giving me? Let's go down some more. Let's see. It's redacting it. Okay. The Targum is there. The Jews don't like to write um, certain things out, so it's, it's redacting it. I'm trying to find a version. Okay, here it is, right here, almost at the bottom. If you can blow this up, Lemuel. On the TV? Yeah. yeah. So, say, see it? That really increases the font, isn't there? No, it's not that. How's that look? It's not bigger. The same size? It's not big, dude. Does that look smaller? Well, anyway, 
Have you seen anything like this before? Um, no, not this, not this topic. Okay. But, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, yeah. In the it's, it's all, for me, uh, for me, it's all about learning this. It's everything is energetic and feeling. Okay. And intellectually, it talks to the that I can understand. Sure. It's hard to explain. I can understand. Can you hear? Yeah. Great. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Okay. A lot of it I don't completely understand, but I understand that I'm not supposed to understand. Yeah. I know what you mean. Right. I do. I'm a a famous feeling. Yeah, you gotta let that intellect go. Yeah. Just, just flow with the paper. Yeah. Is that looking any bigger on the screen? Uh, yeah. Maybe not, uh, yeah. It's, yeah. You've got a little different side, but it's not going to be much. We're going to get out of here. Huh? Oh, we're doing good. Okay. Thank you. Well, I Let's get back here to Genesis. The only other thing I can think of is we can make an extension on the screen. No? Yeah. To where Dad would have to drag it into here so the key will be full screen, but he won't see it on his computer at the same time as this. Okay. Can, can, you, can you read that at all? I can see that. You can see that okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, this says the Hebrew letter bait. No one says that in the bottom right. Huh? Yeah. 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 There you go. This is the Hebrew letter bait. You can see that it is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The Jews believe in Judaism, this is the letter that created the universe. The letter B. You would think it would be the letter Aleph, the first letter, but it's the letter B. And uh, when we start studying the individual letters, uh, you'll understand why. This is actually, this letter B is actually what is called an inseparable, because it's connected. You never see it by itself. It's an inseparable preposition. This word that it is forming is called Bereshit, which means beginning. Reshit means this is Resh. It's, you know, stands for our, our letter R. It's pronounced Reshit. When it has the inseparable, uh, Reshit means beginning. When it has the preposition Bait here, it means in the beginning. It's an inseparable preposition. So it is saying in the beginning, bear created. Bear means created. This is Elohim. It is the plural name of God. It's not singular, it's plural. Okay? F, no translation. If you look over there to the far right, it just says particle direct object marker. No definition as a word. Okay? Whereas, if I put it back here on the sheet, you can see it says first, beginning, starting point, that sort of thing. This, as you see, does not have a definition. And the Jews confirmed that. In Kabbalah, if you ask someone who was studying Kabbalah, what is Aleph Tav? They will tell you that it is it is the entire it's the entire Shekinah glory of God, the entire Shekinah glory of God. In Christianity, I don't know we call, we say the Shekinah glory is Yeshua, is is Jesus. So I laugh whenever I, when I first asked him, I said, what does Allah Tav mean? He said, oh, that's the entire, you know, my Jewish buddies at the Kabbalah Center. Oh, that's the entire Shekinah glory. 
of God. I just thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you're talking about Yeshua. So, oh, let me go back up here. Put it back at the top. Get it in the middle. So as you can see, in the beginning, and who is, you know, there, you know, God, the created God, and right, this would be if it was on the same line, you know, like it, like it normally reads, out of Tav, right next to Elohim. In the beginning, the word, out of Tav, was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning, right here. You see this little dot inside this letter B? Grammatically, that hardens that hardens the sound. Bait, when it has that little dot, is called a begets. When it has that dot in it, it is pronounced like the letter B as in boy. When it does not have that dot, it is pronounced like the letter V, as in Victor. Now, it has that digestion, so it's pronounced like a B. Okay? B. Hard sound, not that. Soft sound. In Kabbalah, Kabbalah teaches this. Judaism, not Christianity. This is straight out of Judaism and Kabbalah. They say that dot represents the entire universe, both seen and unseen. Inside, and they believe that date is the letter that God used to create the universe, or, you know, seen and unseen spirit realm, and our physical corporeal realm. <clears throat> what does John chapter 1 say? says, in the beginning, or out of the beginning, God created, out of his essence, God created everything. Create, you know, in the beginning was the word, or the, the out of time, and the word was with God, and the word was God, Colossians chapter 1, verse 14 to 16, says everything was created out of him or through him and consists of him. Judaism and Kabbalah confirm and correspond to the teachings of Christianity. In John 1, verse 1, and Colossians chapter 1, verses 14 and 16, and Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Can't make this stuff up. They themselves say that that, 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 that dot represents the entire universe. And John chapter 1 says, in the beginning, inside of it. The story of the statement, I know that we heard the story about the Big Bang, which mm -hmm. made it all corporate, that the whole universe was inside of the head of him. Mm -hmm. And it's when it was up or shattered, not on my shown. Right. Very good. And it's just in the thousand pieces. And I feel that. It's synonymous <laughs> and symbolic. I am a person. That's the kind of stuff that's popping in my head. There it is before the Big Bang. Right, right there. there. And that's and that's not on Rosh Hashanah. So that is our theological and doctrinal basis for making the statement uh, "energy of the Hebrew letters," and that is uh, those basically uh, these four scriptures: Revelation chapter one, verse eight. Or you know, all of Re Revelation chapter 1, really. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, uh, basically 14 to 16, a little before that. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 and 3. 
and um, Genesis chapter 1. That's the reason why we did those four scriptures and the way they are interpreted by both Judaism, Kabbalah, and Christianity is the reason, rationale, and foundation for why we actually meditate on those letters. Why we will sit there and look at the letter and meditate on that letter. Meditate on the meaning of it. Meditate on its gematria or, numer or numerical value. That's the reason why we will take certain letters and say them over and over. And, and Christians aren't going to like this word again. Uh, and, and what is, you know, what some will say is like a mantra. Okay, but it's not the mantra of uh, transcendental meditation or anything like that. But these letters, since they're giving off an anointing, when you meditate on them, when you look at them, commit them to memory, every memory that you have is stored in your body somewhere body memory. There is a chemical storage in your body of that picture that you had in your mind. So when you look at these letters and memorize them, you're actually sending the healing power into all parts of your body. Because memory is not just stored in the brain, it's stored chemically throughout the body. And that has been proven scientifically by uh, a woman uh, by the name of Dr. Candace Perk oh, in Molecule, Molecules of Emotion. She's a, uh, she, she's a student of Deepak uh, Chakra. Okay. But she's also a hard, you know, uh, researcher and scientist of uh, biochemistry or, or some field of like biomedical chemistry. And she actually proved this um, at John Hopkins, where she's a you know re was a researcher. Exactly. And they vibrate. Yeah. Right. 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 So <laughs> when you when you're looking at the Olive Bay, when you're looking at a Hebrew letter, and you put that image of that letter in your mind and in your memory, it is stored somewhere. It's stored in the brain where it does its work. But it's also stored in your kidneys, your intestine, your stomach, and other places. And different combinations of the letters will be stored in different places of your body. In Kabbalah, they have text. They say, if you have this illness, just scan these letters. Put these letters in your mind so that your mind will biochemically put them in your body so that supernaturally and spiritually those letters can go to work healing your body because that's what your body is made up of in the first place. You know, what do they tell you to do if you got a kidney infection? Drink a lot of water, flush it out, and, you know, eventually the kidneys will, you know, heal themselves with that flushing of that extra water. You keep going and you just get it out of you. The same way with the Hebrew letters. When you meditate on, on the divine language, it is stored not only in your brain, in those places where memory is stored, it is also biochemically stored in different parts of your body. And you're sending that into your body. That's why God said he sent his word and it healed them. See, it gives new meaning. It gives new meaning and revelation to the scriptures. He sent his word and it healed them. By taking his word, 
just even looking at it, just scanning it, is going to bring healing and health to your body. Say that again. Just looking at the letters, putting it in your, in your mind, putting it biochemically in your body, through the, power, through the power of your mind and the processes of your brain, the neurotransmitters is bringing healing to your body. And as I said before, in Kabbalah, they have passages that if you have this sickness, that sickness, or this illness, okay, you want to, they'll say, meditate on these passages. And it's a sequence of words and letters that they believe will have an effect on the health of your body. Now, another thing I want to say about the Hebrew letters. The first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, no, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, those five books are different than any other parts of the Bible. Because as you read in the Bible, they were written by the finger of God. So God himself designed the Torah, which is the first five books it's called the Torah. The rest of the, of the Old Testament, the Jews, they, they call it, the, you know, they refer to it as a Tanakh, which is, a, you know, an acronym for Torah, Netavim, you know, Kittavim, you know, the writings. And you know, and, and, and the prophets, Torah, writing, and prophets. That's what Tanakh means. You know, the T is Torah. You know, uh, the N is Navim, and the K at the end is Kitavim. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's uh, prophets and writings, instruction, writings, and prophets. But. They refer, they generally, you know, in everyday use, they refer to um, anything other than the first five books they'll call it the, the Tanakh, generally speaking. But it actually. Yeah. Yeah, because you have cough and Hebrew, I guess. Yeah. Tanakh. But um, the first five books. Were, 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 uh, were designed and written by the finger of God. So God himself chose the words and he chose the letters himself with the place and where, you know, he chose what letter to place there and where to place it. So it has far more meaning than just the just translation from Hebrew to English and a far greater purpose. The Jews actually say that the whole Torah from Genesis to Deuteronomy is one whole long name of God. And there are some Jews who have memorized every single letter in sequence. They have, Jews, they have some Jews that they have trained who have that if they determine early that you have that ability, you know what you're going to be doing. Not with an it. autistic savant. Huh? Yeah. So you're not an autistic savant. And, and they're not autistic savants. They're fully functioning, uh, you know, members of society who have remember every word of Torah, every letter. And so it is a special book because it's written. It's considered to be written and designed by God himself. Whereas all of the other books, yeah, God told them to write it. Write down what you see, write your experience. But the man himself wrote, you know, the language, picked the letters, picked the words, and described it himself. So the, the, we can all, the only thing we can do is, you know, write down using, you know, language to express our thoughts and what we see. That's pretty much our ability and where it ends. But God has a, a far greater depth of intellect than we do. Each Hebrew letter has at least nine different meanings. 
Well, what did class were they mean? What did they mean they say Moses wrote it? Is that Moses being a symbol? Moses was, Moses was the one who sat down and wrote the letters out as God told him to write them. Physically in the performance. Right. Okay. But originally it was written by the finger of God. Um, the Jews believe Moses is the greatest prophet because God said, I will speak to Moses face to face. All my other prophets, I will speak to them in dreams, dark similitudes, and uh, parables and you know phrases, whatever. It, you, you have to kind of be able to weed through it. But Moses was the only prophet who spoke with God face to face. Now the question is, is Kabbalah like the very first um, intention or system of Kabbalah really wasn't a writing? Was it, was it like what you're saying, an energy from God? Or, I mean, what's the difference between the Kabbalah and the Torah? And Kabbalah is not really a, is it like really a written instrument. In the very beginning, Kabbalah was more of an energy, right? Exactly. Uh, Kabbalah is a Torah. Kabbalah is the study of Torah. The Zohar, which is the principal text of Kabbalah and its doctrines, the Zohar is only a commentary on the Torah. It's not an additional work. It is merely a commentary on the Torah to explain the deeper meanings. So Kabbalah is a study of the Torah. And Kabbalah is a study of the Torah, which is and the study of the Zohar, or this, the study of, someone last week, uh, Zina, uh, she asked, what is Kabbalah? And I was like, oh my God, I don't have a definition of Kabbalah. It almost doesn't have, I've studied it, but it almost doesn't have a definition. But they say the not root is reception. That's what reception It's the receiving, bro. Okay. You know, it almost really does not even have a, a definition, per se, when you really think about it. It's really difficult uh, to find. It, it's, really, it's really just a study of the Word of God. And it's, um, at its root levels, and it's uh, a, study of, a study of the universe, a study of the known universe, uh, both seen and unseen, the study of the spirit realm. Uh, a study of yourself on a, on on an uh, anatomical level or anthropomorphic level, as well as a solid, a, a subatomic level, even. That's very always just an anatomic. Exactly. So, you know, when we go to the neuroplastic Kabbalah class, you know, we're going to be talking about some aspects of the letters. And we might, from time to time, even in this class, be talking about some aspects of, Kab of Kabbalah. It's, it's very difficult to unravel them, separate this one out, try to micro this one and micro that. It's, 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 it gets to be kind of, you know, at some point you, you, you have to put them back together so that you know what you're, what you're talking about. You know, so that's, as I said, that's the reason why when we do the Torah portion, that's broken out into, uh, imagine writing a book. No one could have done this. How can you write a book such as, only God can do this, write, write a book, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and, have it, and actually have it correspond over thousands of years to precise weeks and months of the year. So that when, when you're reading a story in the Bible, in, in the first five books, when you're reading that story, if you're reading that story according to the Torah portion when it tells you to read it, you're actually reading it at the same time that it occurred in history. Who can write such a book? Only God. I, I think only God can. And, ha, and you know, that's thousands of years old and, and, and can, can do that. You know, that, that, that's, that's a difficult, that, 
you know, when people said, oh, that's just, you know, the Bible is just made up. Yeah, all right. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a lot of proof that that's not the case. A lot of proof. Yeah. Especially if you're going to talk about the Torah. Especially the Torah. It, it's, it's just... It's just too hard to do. And then there's so there there are uh, so many other aspects. Not only does it correspond to the you know to today's date when you read it, astrologically it's the same. Okay. Uh, it's all the same. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, that's, you know, because the Torah was written by the finger of God himself, he designed every letter and placed every letter in his infinite intelligence in there. That's the reason why we meditate on the Torah course and why we, even though we can't translate every word, we will sit there and just look at those words as they are pronounced. Because there is something in that Torah portion designed by God for you at that particular point in time of the year. Every Jew on earth is doing the same thing. Every observant Jew and Christian, because they're, you know, they're Christians like myself. Uh, although I prefer to be, uh, I believe what I practice, I like to call it Hamashiach Judaism. But I'm not offended if someone calls me a Christian, just so you can kind of understand where I'm coming from. But um, there's, you know, every Jew on earth is studying the same thing at the same time. That collective also gives power. That unity. You know, I wish the Christian church would go back to the Sabbath. You know, Constantine stopped, stopped all the Christians from observing the Sabbath on the penalty of death. Now it would pretty much take the same thing to get the Christians to go back to the Sabbath. You, you'd have to threaten to kill it and carry out a few executions to get them to return to, do, to doing what the Bible, you know, actually says. To do. Uh, interesting enough, you know. But... You know, I think now we have a, a solid foundation from which to proceed in the study of the Hebrew language and the energy of the of the olive bed. So I just wanted to lay that foundation this first, you know, in this first meeting. And so you can always, this is going to be, you know, we're recording this, we're broadcasting this live, and we're going to record it. So you can always go back. Um, as you get deeper and deeper into this, you're going to get uh, those same scriptures that I read to you. You're going to get even more and more revelation out of it than you know than you're getting perhaps today. And so we we will record every single session so that you can go back and study it again and pick up what you know you missed or perhaps what your spirit wasn't quite ready for. And then as new people come into the group, they can catch up on their own. Right. You know, as people, you know, people come in and out. You, you go on vacation. Over and over again, right? Yeah, you can't <laughs> keep going over, over and over again. You know, you go on vacation during the summer and we keep going or you, you miss a week or, or, or whatever. Uh, you can always catch up online. So I, I really thank everyone for coming out tonight. And thank everyone out there who's uh, watching us online on Ustream or if you're watching at a later date on, on, on YouTube. I just want to say Shabbat Shalom and blessings. Uh, it is sundown. Uh, Shabbat is uh, ending and we're moving into the, to the new week. And we'll see you, hopefully we'll see you um, Monday night at 7 for the newer Plastic Kabbalah class which is almost like a continuation of this on some level. And Tuesday night at 7, we have our medical Tai Chi class right here. Yeah.
I didn't tell Shane when he came in, I'm a grandmaster of martial arts, been studying ever since I was nine. <laughs> and so I teach a, a moving meditation class in Tai Chi, Qigong, and Bagua here on, here, here on Tuesday. And it's all done as an outreach of this ministry, so that, uh, meaning that it's free. You know, I don't want to put any barriers uh, in front of people to getting the knowledge and revelation. So Shabbat Shalom. See you Monday, hopefully. See you Tuesday, hopefully. And definitely see you next Saturday. Blessings.